Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Get Out of Rap. Here he is, the record holder, Chris Rainsforth. Now the forum, back at the forum. Back and at the forum. Back at the forum. And um, voiceover artist for Bob and Zalan, the Dragon's book. I had someone um, message me. There's a comment on YouTube, actually, saying about your reading of the book, saying it's superb. So, oh, well, I'm looking forward to the second second instalment, mate, and I can I can dust it all off again. <laughs> now, um, as as you will know, as people listen know, Chris is now by far the person that's appeared on this um, on the podcast the most. But we were just saying it has been a while, though, hasn't it? Yeah, I think it was probably November, but, but lots happened since then. <laughs> um, I've, I've left Verant and j- j- come back to the forum, which I mean that took. I mean that's been the you know, six months since turn of the year it's probably been the busiest six months of my life really, uh, in terms of just wrapping up something and then start something else. It just, it's all consuming. So nice to be back though and chatting to you, my friend. Well, it's great to have you back. And um, maybe let's start there because it's something, I guess, what's that decision-making process like where it's not like you were unhappy at Verint, was it? It's... Um, when you've got well, a decision like that to make, how do how do you go about it? it, it there was a few few few. It was a very let's say um, stressful Christmas. Um, so I'd, I'd spoke to Phil and, and the team at the forum just before the Christmas break, um, and you know they were setting out their plans for the future and asked if I'd come back and help kind of shape and, and, and shape the business going forward. And you know it's one of those things where. You, you know, I was really happy at the form the first time around, um, but I felt at the time that I needed to get out and kind of practice what I preach a little bit and, and, and just see the industry from a, from a different lens, just to broaden my skill set, broaden my understanding. And so I went and joined EG Solutions, as, as most people will know, um, which was then taken over by Verant um, not long after I joined. So and then spent five years with Verant pretty much um, and had a wonderful time. But you know, learning and just understanding challenges from a different perspective was really, you know, really important to me at the time. Um, and then the opportunity to go back came and it, was, it wasn't like I was unhappy. So it's, it's a harder decision to make. I think it, if you're unhappy in a role and you get offered another role, it's, a, it's an easier switch to make. But on the flip side of it, this was difficult in the sense that you're moving from a level of security that you've got, you've got kind of comfortable with um, a routine and a role that I was comfortable with at Berrin and I got to do a lot of things that you know and, and opportunities that I would have never had if I hadn't been working at Berrin so we had to do a bit of soul searching over the Christmas break and it was it came down to pros and cons and what did I want for the remainder of my career essentially and you know I'm still only young kind of mid-40s um, but it's one of them where you think well how long do you continue doing that kind of solutions consulting piece, the technology landscape is changing at a pace that we've probably never experienced before in the industry. And you kind of look at that and then you think, well, at the forum, I get an opportunity to help operationalize that stuff and start to think about how do we add value into what we do at a, at a functional level, as opposed to just at a technology level, how can that technology enable people to do things differently and get the opportunity to, watch people develop and share and just grow. And I think everything that I've been passionate about over the years, just about best practice and people really evangelising the industry and, 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 and making it a professional place to work. And that was the that was the kind of hook that brought me back into the forum. And the things I've been doing over the last few years uh, have been some phenomenal output and, and some phenomenal stories of success with, with, the, with the people that they work with. And I thought that was the... That was the thing that drew me back in and, and I thought to myself, you know what, I can make a difference again. So let's go, let's go make that difference. I think there's a couple of key phrases, isn't it, there, that um, helping people, um, doing something for the industry and, and making a difference, you know, that kind of, um, that's a very, very hard uh, attraction to, to resist. The, the, the pros and cons list, is that something, did it just help validate the instinct or were you genuinely kind of open? It, no, so it, so it, did, it did help validate because, you know, you lose, it's like anything. I've gone from a big 
organisation, all the trappings of that, you know, the, the employee benefits that come Helicopters. on. Helicopters. Yeah, well, the employee benefits, you know, you know, you know, the pensions and the holidays and all that type of stuff. And you kind of go from that and the, the security and the trappings that, that, that kind of affords you into moving back into it relatively small organisation in, in terms of what it, what it does and that kind of bit of security kind of moves away but on the flip side of that you know it's going to be as successful as we want to make it so this, you know if yeah, I can look at it and go if we want to be safe and secure and continue that we've got to put the hard work in to make that that happen I can't just sit on my laurels you know Verant will always make money whether I'm there or not fundamentally you know, the forum, I've got an opportunity to, to really make a difference. So I, you kind of look at it from that side and, and, and more of a more of a calling, if, if I want to be yeah. cheesy phrase, as opposed to no, it's not. I be, being wrapped it. up in the fact that, you know, I might be safe and secure at Verum for a period. I, you know, I, I just, for me, it was getting back to doing something that I loved doing years ago uh, and just seeing the growth of the industry over that time and the way people want to develop themselves and develop their teams and, you know, having a playing a small part in that is is something that really appealed to me. Yeah. And so, how long have you been back? So I came back on the first of March, um, which was exactly nine years to the day that I originally joined the forum. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So there's a bit of synergy there. It was uh, quite quite interesting. It's funny how those sorts of things happen, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's been it's been great. It's been and it's been lovely to be back. And you know, the team's still really strong. And getting to work with people I really admire. You know, whether it's Phil, Paul or Dave or the rest of the team, people that I've worked with in the past, they're still there and still kind of pushing forward great initiatives. And I've just had a chance to reconnect with friends, really, and it don't feel like work. It, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's a really nice place to be. Well, that's great. I think I've talked for a lot of people to say it's great to see you back. Uh, it, feels, it feels right. It's a good fit. You know, it's kind of that's who I associate you uh, with and um, yeah, more more power to you. Good luck as well. No, oh, cheers, mate. What is what are the big things then that are kind of that you're working on that uh, that excite you about the, the the next six months, let's say, or the year ahead? So, I th- so, so the key things for me that I really, I think, what we what we focus on is all about changing what we do particularly as an organisation, to put the focus on learning again. Now, it's been something that's been ongoing for the last few years, but you can imagine an organisation like the Forum, which is about best practice, it's about community, it's about sharing, it's about, you know, utilising the industry that we've got to create initiatives and create change and drive forward a a better way of working. Um, And the pandemic hit it hard, as you can imagine, you know, going from, a face-to-face organisation really to to a virtual organisation overnight. A lot of people would have had the same kind of issues. Um, But the work they've done over the last few years in developing learning content and material to help really, you know, go back to that professionalising the industry, giving people skills and development and opportunity to to drive forward there is something that we're really, really passionate about. You know, we're changing the whole approach to learning over the summer, um, developing a more kind of succinct and accessible learning management system that will take all our material and and, and, and what's already there, you know, via via the stuff that we've got, really kind of giving it a a, a, a true learning platform for people in the contact centre industry. Uh, And that, you know, is going to be phenomenal, in my opinion. Mm, I thought I couldn't agree more just around the whole um, professionalizing what we do and really you guys uh, you always seem to kind of aim it at the leaders of the future but the operate operators now and I think that's such an overlooked sort of strata in our in our industry you know it's either pitched high level or or entry what about the people that are in it doing it now how do you how do you help them realize that they they are in it they're, they're professionals and their development is important yeah and, and, and you know I, it's one of those things it's like anything you work hard uh, and the thing that i get really proud of is you know if you go on linkedin and people are saying i've been accredited by the forum i've, I've completed my training course i've done this and i've got this accreditation now to show people that i am a you know a, a good resource planner or a 
good analyst or or whatever it might be. And I, and I think that's the, the important bit that we just give parity to the industry around people's skill sets. You know, you know, you can go through CIPD, you can go through other organisations where if you're in a function where you work, you can get skills and development and accreditations for that. And it's something that's missing in the contact centre industry for people that are there doing the job day in, day out. And it is something that we're kind of really proud of, the fact that we can say, look, this is the skill journey you're on, this is the development journey you're on, this continuous improvement, this continuous learning pathways that are available to you to continue to develop your skills and get involved with networks of people that are on similar journeys or have gone through a similar journey and are willing to share their experiences. And those those key moments through someone's career, I think, uh, are just really powerful. Um, you know, if you're running a resource planning team that have all been fully accredited and trained and have got that kind of base level of knowledge and understanding that's consistent across the team, everyone's pushing in the right direction. You know, and I think there's things that just you can't, you can't, you, you can't kind of quantify the value in in that type of development and learning and, and, and kind of just success of people going out and wanting to make a difference in their day-to-day -day roles. And I think it because because it because it requires the companies they're at to to buy into it, it also has the added benefit of saying we're taking your role seriously and we're investing in you because you we're they're they're the facilitators, I guess, aren't they, of saying we're working with the forum. You're gonna you have this course available that you could go on. What do you think? Yeah, and, it, and it's really powerful. So it's really interesting. So we've got we've got companies that do do that. You know, they will invest in pathways. But we've we, we, we've we've levelled it now to a point that if you are just wanting to do your own development, there is an entry point for you to come on and just pay if you want to pay for it and you want to pay for a course. It's easy, it's accessible, it's cost effective. So that's great. If, you know, you know, even if you don't want to, or the company you're working for doesn't have the budget or whatever yeah. it is to kind of invest heavily, yeah. if you want to invest in your own kind of development, there's entry level pathways for you to do that. And I think that's the what we're trying to do is make it accessible to everybody, regardless of, of where you sit in the organization. And regardless if you've got the, the corporate budget behind you, you know, if you want to invest in yourself. There's a way you can invest in yourself at really low, low price points. And I think that, that was important to us as an ethos to, to try and make it as accessible to everybody. That's brilliant. Because the accreditation and being part of the programme, all of these things are brilliant. But I guess fundamentally, it's helping people gain new skills. Yeah. Obtain usable knowledge, right? And that that is is the be all and end all. I mean, that you could help supercharge people's careers. Yeah, it's, it, it's what we're trying to do. It's take away from the... I uh, don't want to sound kind of too blasé. It's a bit... This is just... You know, but we all see headlines, right? So we all see headlines about what's going on in the industry. Attrition rates are high. You know, um, yeah. it, um, you know recruitment, we're struggling to recruit. Yeah. Our, our demand profiles are going through the roof. Service levels are being decimated. And we see all these headlines from different studies and reports, and, 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 and that's all they are, is headlines. What we don't see is what, what can I do in my role, what can my team do within our kind of sphere of influence and, and, and sphere of control, do to try and address some of those headlines? What can we do? So try to take it below the headline and go, right, what is actually your yeah. issue? What are you, you know, so if you're attrition time, what is it that you're doing as an organisation that might be driving that? What can we do to help you improve your process, improve your setup, improve your approach to things to try and solve some of those problems rather than just saying, oh, we've got a problem. Yeah, we well, might have a problem, but that problem's not going to go away if we don't do something about it. Um, so that's what we're trying to do is take people beyond the headline and, and, and you know, try to give them some real, Kind of confidence that they can make some decisions and some changes that are going to have a positive impact on turning some of those things around um, and you can only do that if you invest the time in doing it you know and, and, and mm. what we see is that people are willing to invest their time in their own development because they know that on the back of that they can make a difference in their organization and that for me is just it's it's a wonderful thing to see and that kind of going going past the headlines 
does that kind of resonate across other bits and um, sort of projects that you're that you're working on? Because you can, I think, a lot of us in the industry could probably come up with most of the the headlines ourselves. You know, kind of whether it's the advancement of technology and that yeah. actually that can be a bit confusing at times. That there's also hybrid working. What does that mean? You know, yeah. is is that kind of you guys are kind of putting those up there and saying? What does this actually mean? Yeah, and, and, and it's exactly right. So we can say this is what we, you know, we, we speak to. We've got what, over 150 members, uh, kind of from a membership perspective, but then, you know, in, at an individual level, yeah. there's thousands of people that are interacting with us on a day to day basis, whether that's through networking groups, whether it's through kind of learning pathways, wherever it might be. And we kind of take our time, our job is to facilitate that. But we facilitate that in a way that allows us to draw through what are the real problems that people are having in their businesses and organisations. And that allows us to take that away and go, right, what can we do to help people think differently about the problem or put steps in place to try and try and try and turn it around? And I think, you know, flexible working is a perfect example. You know, our stance is very much and, and, and it's easy. It's, it's, easy, it's always easy to say than do. right? And we, we kind of fully appreciate that. But we're seeing all different ends of the scale of it. So people going fully flexible, fully out there, fully remote, and they're getting on with it. We've got mm. others on the other side that are forcing everyone back into the offices, whatever reason that is. Our view is that somewhere along the line, it'll land in the middle, where you just offer flexibility and choice and people do that. And there'll be iterations of this over the next few years, right? And those iterations will be driven by commercial factors, they'll be driven by things like, you know, people that are tied into rental agreements with yeah. commercial property suppliers, when they come around at the minute, they might have a big massive office and they feel the pressure to fill that office up and make it commercially viable. But in a couple of years' time, when that contract comes up for renewal, what's their decision making process then? Do they need to rethink that operating model at that point? So it's not going to be something that people will change today and it'll be in place for, for, the, for the end of time. I think there'll be a few different iterations of this over. But what we can do is provide guidance and make examples and support for those people that are doing different approaches to it. So how are this company who've gone fully flexible and doing self-scheduling, how is it actually working in reality? So the headline says we can do this and it's really good and really positive for people. What's the reality of it? What's the work that has to go into it? You know, and and is is it is it worth it um, in terms of the benefits that you get from it and you know our, our old view is if your people are happy then that's the kind of approach you've got to take um there's the never really has been a one size fits all but i think there's even less of a one size fits all now than there ever has been in the industry you've got to find something that works for you as an organization mm. fundamentally mm. works for your people so we'll kind of try and pull those examples together and show how people are utilizing different things to to try and drive engagement or kind of you know stickability in terms of the, the kind of way forward approach and that'll change one of the things that we focus on a lot of is this whole idea around um, operational playbooks so we've talked a lot about playbooks in the past where you kind of this thing happens and, and we make these adjustments because of that it might be a planning playbook or a real-time playbook that if demand increases this is what we need to change and this is what we adjust and, and all that type of stuff we're trying to get people to think about it slightly differently. So moving away from the what if to the if then. So if mm. this if this situation happens, then this is how we operate for whatever that period might be. But looking at the whole thing, so how does that affect our recruitment strategy? How does that affect our budget? And they're getting these things agreed in advance that says, if throughout the year these situations happen, we've got a plan to, 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 to deal with it. So we stop firefighting. In the yeah. sense that, all right, so we've done the what if analysis. All right, what that what if tells us a likely outcome. What's the then? What mm. do we actually mm. do in that situation? And let's get all this stuff agreed up front. You know, so we, we you know we're talking to people a lot more now around the go through annual budget cycles, but they're not. So actually, those budget cycles become quarterly budget cycles because the industry and the the the, the kind of it is changing so rapidly that you can't put all your eggs in one basket on a year and go, this is what I think our year is going to look like. Mm. Actually, no, let's do it in shorter sprints. Let's look at it differently and go, if the situation happens, then this is how we're going to operate. And we'll operate for this period. We've already got the backing from 
the, the board or the senior team, all these things have already been agreed. And we just put that play into, in, in, into action at the point where we need to, rather than trying to react all the time. We kind that's of really nice. do our reacting first and our that's, thinking first. That's really nice because I, I can envisage that then, let's say a situation happens, you've prepared something in your playbook, you apply it, even if it doesn't work, because you've got something to, to then review afterwards, you've got the foundation to go, right, 90% of this didn't work, 10% did. So how do we, what, let, let's look at the 90% and what do we need to do differently? But you need a starting point. So there's no, there's no downside um, to that. And I think the challenge it seems everyone will always kind of throw back at you is we don't have time to sit and plan well you what would you say to that make time (laughs) yeah again right it's it's easier said than done but where we see successful organizations doing things differently that are adding value both at an operational level and a people level they're the ones that are thinking about the future a little bit and they're doing more forward thinking about okay you know they've taken the pandemic as a real kind of fuse really that kind of ignite and go we can't ever be in that situation again now the like yeah. something like that and again is relatively low but let's not be put in that situation but it's given them that kind of thinking space to go actually how do we deal with these things differently you know if attrition continues to happen we need to put a stop to it but if it doesn't how do we react how do we you know You've seen it in the airports. Airports are a perfect example at the minute. An industry that just didn't recruit. They didn't recruit because the timing was off in terms of when things, and they just weren't prepared and weren't ready. And that's what's happening. It's just, it's a, it's a, we can't recruit people quick enough to deal with the demand that's increased. And we can take lessons from that from a contact centre industry perspective to go, things will change over time. So yes. what happens if this happens, then what are you going to do about it? And how far in advance do you need to think about these things before it impacts your plan um and i just think yeah i think the, the more time we invest just thinking about how we can make a difference going forward the less stress is put on us at the point where these things occur now you know i always use the example of the, the nightingale hospitals are a perfect example of this right mm. everyone goes what a waste of money and I was like, well, on the flip side, actually, it's a really positive thing that we didn't use them. Yeah. Right. But we had a plan, and I'm not going to get into the politics and the, the merits of it all. But it's that type of situation where plan for it. And if it doesn't happen, brilliant. But and also to your, out. So also to your point, if you take that example, if they're ever needed again, they've done it once. Yeah. So it's going to be they're going to be better doing it again, you'd like to think. I, I mean, I love the idea. I think, I think the, the the pandemic has absolutely helped or changed the narrative in as much as you can have those kind of um, sessions where you say, right, what if this happens? Because if anyone says, well, that's not likely to happen, is it? You've got the fact that no one could have envisaged what the pandemic would have done. And it's everyone, you know, rightly focuses on uh, home working and those types of discussions, that as an industry, we just tore up what we thought was the norm and did something unheard of. So it kind of shows if it's happened once, it can happen again. It might not be, it, it might not be the same as a pandemic, but it, it equally should be something that allows us to open our minds a bit more and think, right, what are we going to do different? What are, how can we recruit differently? What do we need to do differently as an industry? I think it's great. I think it's brilliant. Uh, you know, and I think the only way we get better is by talking about these things and trying stuff. And I think, you know, sometimes we get we get scared to try things in case it fails, but you'll never know mm. unless you try stuff. And in reality, what's the worst that could happen? I think that's the kind of tipping point you've got to kind of make. I think if we mess this up, or it doesn't work out, can we flip back quickly? Mm. Can we readjust quickly? And if you think these things through in advance, you can react 
smarter to the changing environment. Where people fail sometimes is because they haven't thought it through. They've reacted to a situation to try and fix a problem that's now appeared. And because that hasn't been thought through, it doesn't necessarily stick. So then they end up chasing the tail. Whereas if you think it through in advance and you test it and it doesn't work, you can revert back and you can go again. I think sometimes because we're not pre-planning potential outcomes, the you know, the what ifs and the if thens, because we're not pre-thinking about these things, we make quick decisions to try and solve a problem. And those quick decisions typically haven't been thought through. And then they're the ones that don't stick or cause knock-on effects further down the line. Um, so I think it is all about just taking some stock and having time to think about it. You know, we talk a lot about living in a VUCA world. So if you heard the term VUCA, but that kind of volatility, uncertainty, um, complexity and ambiguity. And if we apply that contact sentence, we, we do live in a VUCA world. Say that again. Volatility, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. I've never heard that. That's great. What? So, go, go away. Oh, for those that listen, in, in our best practice guide this year, there's a lovely article on the VUCA world. So uh, uh, go, go download now. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Live. Um, quick, quick plug. Um, but yeah, but we're looking at it from those perspectives around how does that apply against our industry and what can we do to address some of that uh, and make sure we're prepared for some of those volatile situations to, to deal with the uncertainty of what's going on and, and what's going to continue to kind of happen over the coming months and years as we kind of rebaseline the industry because that's when we're, we're in a we're in a position of rebaseline um, does that um so sorry one more time say it again volatility uncertainty, volatility uncertainty complexity and ambiguity and that is recognizing this is our, uh, these are the environments we find ourselves in. Let's bring some order to it, right? It's a model, is it? Yeah, yeah. so it's been around for years, right? Love it. So it's been, it has been around for years and we've just taken it and how do we apply that in, in what we're doing? So the Harvard Business Review have, have, have written loads of things about the VUCA world, um, but there's loads of research out there on it. Um, and we, we've taken it and, and kind of applied it around customer contact and contact and conversations and, and things like that. So it is- Because it's, I, well, I think it's great. Everyone can certainly, re, you know, relate to, to their yeah. work. If you've been in our industry, these are not, this isn't something that's going to make you go, what the hell is he talking about? Like, we don't encounter that. No, it, it, but everyone does in some, in some shape or form. And like I say, we've, we've done, a bit of research on it we've, we've published a couple of articles on it over the last kind of couple of years so you know take some time to have a read up on it I, but i think it just helps reframe people's thinking around kind of what they can go out and and, and do and you know and it, it's like anything we, we talk at a strategic level with our strategy we've got a strategy and leadership group um as part of the forums these the directors and your heads of that kind of and looking at the strategy and to your point their strategic thinking needs to help drive forward change within the industry and innovation and all that good stuff. But fundamentally, we need to make sure that that is kind of embedded at an operational level so people understand their part in the strategy. So what are they trying to do? What can they kind of react to? What can they plan for? What can they uh, control within their, like I say, within their sphere of influence? Um, but making sure that kind of, there's that direct line of sight through the organisation that everyone knows where they where they fit um, and what their role is and what their purpose is and all that stuff. Just it's about bringing people together. That's why we use the term playbook because you know a playbook is a sum of all parts. Even if it's you know if you go back, you you like American sports, yeah, right? If you yeah. kind of you know look at it from that perspective, it is it's that thing going this if if. In this situation, this is what we're going to do. And we've planned for it and we've practiced it and we understand it and we know what's going on. So we don't need to discuss it at the point that it happens. We just apply it. Yeah, um, you, yeah the, you know what? The concept of the playbook is is fascinating. If you, especially in um, American football, I mean, these are massive dossiers, right? Yeah. Of every single scenario, 
that might unfold in a game, in a season. And regardless of whether you're somebody that's not expected to play or the backup kicker or you're the, the star of the show, the team, there is an expectation that you absolutely memorise that playbook uh, and can refer to it instantly. And if you can't, you're not in the team. And I, I think it's fascinating. And I think that's, if we can if we can look at our contact centre operations in a similar way, we can continue to add value and react in a way that we've just not been able to react like before. You know, we've done it for years, Martin, where you, you kind of have this firefighting approach to contact centre management, right? And, and I've seen it all over the world, right? And it's not, you know, it's, it's common. Um, but I think we've got so much skill and so much talent uh, within the industry that we can be smart about how we apply that skill and that talent and not put, you know, talk around attrition, what drives attrition, mm. stress and uncertainty and all these things will drive people to go, you know what, I'm going to go over there because it looks a little bit happier place to be. And if we can just give people something that allows them to take back a little bit of control, that allows them to make sure everyone knows the levers that are being pulled and the, the outcomes and the impacts and that type of stuff just helps people make decisions easier, quicker, smarter, um, without putting that stress on, without having those sleepless nights, without having to worry about kind of, you know, the impact of stuff. Because we've done all that. We've done all that thinking already. Um, and it's just about application. And, you know, if we've skilled people up, applying it should be the easy bit. I, you know, <laughs> I smiled then when you said firefighting. And um, every day, you, you know, if you, Yesterday, I was talking to someone where we can all, if you've been in operations and you've got to contact centre manager kind of level, I think even team leader, but definitely contact centre manager level and above, um, firefighting uh, is the norm. And uh, I was talking to someone yesterday and for them, survival was success. And I think if we can do something, because I think we've all worn this badge of honour of teetering on the verge of burnout or actually burning out isn't cool, but we all kind of go, yeah, yeah. You know, we, we all get it. We all understand that living on the edge of just about coping is where you're at a lot of the time in operations and that you you leave and then the next day, you strap in and you you survive again, that there has to be uh, a better way, that it isn't something that we should accept as the norm. No. Because for the people that have survived, yeah, fine, you can look back with a bit of rose-tinted glasses and go, yeah, it is tough, and yeah, I was firefighting a lot, but actually for everyone that survived, there's three people that didn't and burnt out and left the industry and we've lost them for good. You know, so we do need to do something um, different. I'm not being flippant when I when I was smiling then when you said about firefighting. It's just that it's something that we can all relate to. Yeah, and I think we just, you know, people say we haven't got time. Well, you haven't got time because you're not creating time. You know, we, we mm. work every day with people that are investing time in people or their teams or their organisations to think differently. And, and, and operate differently and develop what they want to do. And undoubtedly, we then start to see them making improvements. You know, we start to see them building confidence. We, we start to see them. So, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we, we talk, we've been working with a company and, and taking team leaders through some, some kind of just introductory to planning stuff, really, just really getting them to think about the relationship between the operation and, and the planning team. And we talked to them about, you know, the stuff that you can blame on others and use that as an excuse not to do something. Or you can take a little reflective view of yourself and go, what could I do differently? Mm. What can I do differently? And actually, when you start to think about what can be done differently, what if I'd have behaved in a slightly different way or taken a slightly different approach, 
what would the impact have been on my people? What would the impact have been on our service goals? What would the impact be on that? And, and, and getting to think about rather than trying to think about, well, they don't do that. If they don't do that, it impacts me. Well, that's fine. But let's think about what they can do differently. But what can you do differently? Can you communicate differently? Can you explain things differently? Can you take a more proactive approach to some stuff rather than waiting to be told what to do? And just getting them to think differently about their own individual approach to how they go about things. As you know, they're starting to see confidence grow, the results change. And, and, and that's all we're looking to do is just plant those little seeds in people, give them some time, give them some kind of structure around how do you apply things in a slightly different way and let them take ownership for it. And I think that, for me, is just... The only way we can get better is being collectively consistent um, in an organisation. Now, we're not saying that, you know, everybody operates in the same way. You've got to operate in the way that's right for you. But there's different ways you can do it but at an operational level, especially at a team leader level. And then as you move up to that, that they have to work in, as a unit. They have to be a team of teams, essentially, to go, mm. this is how we behave in these situations this is where we invest our time this is where we listen this is where we communicate this is how we engage and if everyone is consistent in that approach styles might be slightly different you know that's fine you know i'm not going to kind of dictate anything around how you do things in that sense but if you've got a little framework around how you operate as a team then everyone understands what's happening and what's going on and everyone understands the impact your behaviour will have on the broader operation and vice versa. And I think just giving people those little insights to think about these things in a slightly different way is the only way forward in terms of driving improvement. What are the team leader groups that you're um, sitting with and going th- and, and kind of doing the um, relationship with them and planning what are some of the like the key things that you're that you're seeing? So well, a lot of it's just understanding. So we'll, we 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 can get quite technical with them. So we'll, we'll talk to them about the power of one and shrinkage, and you know th- those types of elements that say, look, this is the impact you have when you do certain things. So trying to re- try to build that relationship, there's always a reason why planning say no, always for for you know, and it could be yeah. hundred and one different yeah. things. There's always a reason. What we're trying to do is build that relationship so they understand why they're saying no. And mm. actually, it's not a no, it's a not now. Mm. And how can you build that relationship up to go, you know, they've said no, but actually let's rebuild that conversation that says you can't do that right now. You can do it later this afternoon or you can do it tomorrow morning because I'm expecting demand to be different or, you know, whatever it is, these little things that happen and just building up those communication paths that say this is why we're making some of these decisions. This is what you can do. And actually, once you understand it, you don't start blaming other people. You can just actually understand that impact that I'm having, that if I decide to do this, there's going to be a knock-on effect. And similarly, if planning decide to do something, there's going to be a knock-on effect. But there's a reason behind it. Understand the reason, you can then understand the, the outcome. And once you understand the outcome, you can then make a change that's going to be beneficial for everybody within the within the operation. So it's just... What we're trying to do is just rebuild those relationships um, just so everyone understands. You know, go back to that whole thing of going, everyone in the organisation is yeah. all trying to achieve the same thing. Mm. But if we all go off it and try to achieve it without any kind of structure or joined up thinking, it'll cause more problems than, than it solves. I, I was definitely a team leader that caused problems in that sense. And um I can remember sitting with uh, the lady who was my kind of liaison in in planning, and she said, "You know, you're you're uncoordinated, uncommunicated actions are causing real challenges for our team, but also for our um, for your peers, and most importantly for customers. And here's what happens when you." arbitrarily in the in, in the moment decided to take off your entire team to to do play piggyback or do something mental yeah. um and you know that kind of awareness of right okay 
I've, I've got to find a way from self-awareness point of view, I've got to find a way that when I have these creative uh, moments to note it down and then plan it better rather than just go, woohoo, I can do what I want. <laughs> and, and that's what we're trying to get across, is going, you know, the, the impact that you have, you know, if you decide, you know what, we're having a bit of a busy day, so I'm going to just let all my team go offline for half an hour. All right? Might work really well for your little group 12, right, that you've taken off and all yeah. half an hour. But the other 150 people in the call centre that are now taking twice the amount of calls that they're taking, they're not happy and jolly. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's yeah. like, so it's just yeah. having that, that understanding and, and kind of realisation of going, your action is going to drive a reaction. Mm. And actually, is that reaction negative or positive? There might be some positive elements to it, but the overwhelming might be that it's actually has a negative impact on the broader operation, whether that's at a customer level, whether it's a colleague level um, or a business level. Um, there will be an impact. So it's just making sure that we those lines of communication are open um, and, and, and you work smart there to, 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 to A, make sure you're getting that valuable time with your, with your team because it is valuable. And, you know, we're not saying let's take it away from people. We're just saying let's just make sure it's at a point where it's going to work for everybody. Um, and, and, and kind of, you know, the, the team lead a bit. You can get lost in your little bubble of mm. 12. Mm. But actually, as a team leader, you've got a responsibility for the wider operation and kind of go, okay, so yeah, I need to look after my team. But there has to be that kind of awareness of the impact it has on the other teams in the, in the contact centre or, or, or operational area. So it is, that's all we're doing is just trying to just think differently and get people to think differently, um, plan smarter and just talk to each other. You know, I think that's the, the key thing at the minute. Talk to each yeah. other and make sure everyone knows what's happening. Getting as you do to work with and talk to and see today's team leaders, what are the challenges they're facing? And do you, do they give you cause for optimism when you look at them? Are they? Uh, yes. Sorry, I cut you off there before you finish your question. No, no. Um, no. So, so yeah, yes, it does. But right. the funny thing is, right, challenges team leaders face they are exactly the same challenges I was facing as team leader twenty years ago. Mate. It's kind of reassuring in a let, weird let, way. Let's let you know. Let's let's be real about that. I think the the, the for all that the industry's changed, people don't really on mass, right? Yeah. In terms of yeah. their motivations and their behaviours and things like that. Um, so I, you know, so those same challenges we have, you know, sickness levels, you know, you know, they might be higher today than the were, but I remember working in a business where we had a twenty percent sickness rate. I, mm. I'm, I'm talking to organisations still that I've got a 20% sickness rate, 25 you know I mean? So the, the challenges of the team leader are fundamentally the same. What has changed more significantly is the fact that people now are managing distributed teams in a lot of cases. Not yeah. everybody, not everybody, but I never managed a distributed team. They have a need to, everyone was in the office doing what we were doing. The only thing that happened is that they might have, I might have some people on shift and some people off shift and they were never all together at any point, but that still happened. Right, so that's still a challenge today, right? But the fact that people are now doing distributed teams, and I think that that is something we need to invest in from a people perspective. I do think there's still a gap there um, in making sure we treat people the same, whether they're office based, home based, or anywhere in between. Um, I think there's still a gap there. I think technology helps with some of that gap, um, but its skills uh, are the only thing that can that can really develop and people and personality and then we've talked about in the past that you know when I started as a team leader it was a very transactional role mm -hmm. you know you, you, you're managing HR processes and, and disciplinary processes and whatever else um, and then as the kind of 2000s developed we then wanted everybody to be a coach but we'd never employed them to be a coach we'd employed them to follow the processes of HR so they didn't have those skills to be able to do that. And then there was a big wave of getting people to become coaches and some had the aptitude and the competency and, and some didn't. Um, and then there was a bit of a flip again. Then it kind of flipped again and wanted them to do everything. Uh, and we're in that stage again now where we're expecting team leaders to do a bit of everything, whether that's mm -hmm. HR management, whether it's coaching and development, uh, and we're spreading them thin again. And that is the risk. And now we're doing it in a distributed team. 
where I've got some of my team sat next to me. Yeah. Who are easy to engage with because I can just swing the chair around and have a chat. Yeah. Um, uh, or I've got Chris who's sitting at home and he's never been in the office for six months. Um, I've spoke to him as often as I've spoke to Martin sitting next to me here. Those things are still very grey for a lot of people. And mm-hmm. I don't think we're anywhere near solving that problem. Mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of people that do it well. Uh, and there is a lot of people still on a trajectory of improvement that they need to get there. And I would say that's the biggest issue we've got. Uh, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I hazard hazard to comment um, whether this is a popular comment or not. I would hazard a comment that the confidence in our operational leaders to do that is partly around, the, will be partly helping drive the decision to get people back on site if we can, because there's a skill gap or a capability gap or a confidence gap in managing that remote team. Um, so if they could get them back on site, then they're, they're back in their little comfort zone. And I think that's the risk. Uh, I think, mm. and I think we are. I think some decisions are being informed by our own confidences rather than what's right for our people. Really, really interesting point. Very astute, I'd say. That um, that has to be that has to be a factor. I was going to ask you, actually, you and me both benefited um, and kind of caught the bug for the industry. When I started, like a lot of people, I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't have a particularly, I didn't think this is going to be amazing. Um, But very quickly, I discovered, like you, what I liked about it, right? The people around me, the laughs that you had. What's your view on one of the things you mentioned earlier on around uh, attracting new talent and that new talent may want to work from home and we can do that now. They won't know what they're missing potentially or if they're of that mindset, because I think it's different mindsets prefer the, the banter and the buzz. But for the people, if they do, let's say they're in that mindset, they don't know necessarily what it's like because we don't do much pushing out there of here's what it could be like. Is that is that a concern for our industry, do you think? I, I don't know if it is, right, in, in the grand... Because I think the world's changed, right? So I've been on a bit of a kind of high horse over the last six months or so around how we recruit different types of people at the industry. So we see a lot, don't we? You know, we talk around diversity and we, we do that. Yeah. But I still think underrepresented groups, people with disabilities, yeah. things like that are still really underrepresented. Naturally, we've got a massive opportunity for the industry to open our doors to anybody as long as they can do the work. Working from home could be a massive driver for us if there was access issues or yeah. kind of you know support issues in the workplace. We can remove some of that by employing people that can work remotely. That might not, you know fit the normal profile for, for, for the organisation for whatever reason. So I think we've got an opportunity to become different as an industry. Um, and, I, and, I, and I'm really, really passionate about, you know, going out and broadening your, your kind of your resource pool uh, and broadening your recruitment kind of strategies for, for kind of embracing people from, from all walks of life and, and, and all backgrounds. Because actually working from home benefits that, I think, yeah. for, for a lot of Good, people. Yeah. Um, so, so I don't think so. But I think, you know, again, goes back to what I said at the beginning. If we create choice, people do what they want to do. All right? So if we have an office and we say to people, you can work at the office if you want, then let them come to the office. If you want to work at home, they can work at home. And let them to make their own decisions. I think what people's motivations are slightly different nowadays than what they were. I mean, I was what, I don't know how old I was, 18 or something when I first, well, earlier than that, but I only wanted to earn some money for beer. Yeah. You know, that was it. I just wanted to go out. Nothing's and changed. That's, that's, that's all that's <laughs> what I'm doing. Um, but I just, wanted, I just wanted to earn enough money so I could buy it on a weekend, right? The fact that I met a lot of pals and, 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 and built relationships was a kind of byproduct of that. But I think in today's world, people's motivations are slightly different. And especially over this pandemic, you know, we've looked at it and actually the most important things to me now are spending time with my family. I always value time with my family, but I value it a lot more now than I ever have done. Mm. Because you didn't think, you, you never think the worst is going to happen mm. at, at a human level. We don't. Mm. We, we never think that's going to happen to us. Um, 
but this happened to all of us. And actually, you kind of think, well, actually, I'm not bothered about going to the office now because I'd rather be at home when Amy comes in from school or I'll rather yeah. be home. Wife gets in from school, out from work, and and you kind of so I think people are thinking differently. I think as long as the opportunity for people to come to the office is there, then it goes back to that point of going making sure we do something that is inclusive to people. Mm. So one of the companies we were working working with do this kind of, you know, everyone can work from wherever they want, but they're quite flexible. If you want to work, oh, I want to come to the office, it's fine. But the mandate, it's not they're not mandate, but they kind of they, they're putting in these value add days where it's one day a month or whatever it might be to come in and do something this kind of meaningful or purposeful presence to call it right so if you're in the Love office that. if you're in the office there's a purpose for you being there so let's have a team meeting let's do a collaboration activity let's do something that adds value for the collective being together and pre-planning them in so we go you know what actually a week on Tuesday is going to be our, our kind of all together day and then we'll just do something. We'll do something. You know, we'll work on an initiative, or we'll, we'll kind of do some, you know, like I say, collaboration type stuff. Or we'll do. We'll make sure we do this one to ones that day, or face to face. And we'll get together as a team, and we'll do stuff. So there's a purpose for people getting together to keep building those relationships and, and to kind of making sure that camaraderie still exists um, within the team. So th- these ways of addressing it, and, and people will embrace what they want to embrace. But I think the as we professionalise the industry and people start to see it as a career that adds value, and I think we're doing that more and more as, as time goes on, you know, we you know, going back to the early conversation around just accrediting people's skills. I think mm. we have, you know, over 250 people go through some level of accreditation in the last 12 months, you know, across, right. across mm. like 50 odd different organisations. So you kind of go, people are starting to put value in people in development and skills so i think as we you know our whole thing was we want to make sure that the contact center doesn't have that um that that kind of negative perception that it has kind of had for the entirety of it being um being around and jillian spoke about it didn't she on, on the podcast the other day um around she didn't know much about it all she had was that negative perception yeah. that negative perception of so, you know, that's someone that's doing an academic study that's coming through it who is still seeing that. And we've been trying to push this agenda, Martin, for years around it's not that type of place. There yeah. is committed, professional, dedicated people doing a really hard job. Um, so we'll give them a bit of slack type of thing. Um, but we, we, you know, So as we invest in people, as we invest and professionalise, that whole kind of, negative perception will start to disappear. And I think we've just got to embrace that we're moving into a different way of working now within the industry and people will engage with it at different levels, depending on their personalities and, 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 and their way. If you want to get together with your team, you will find a way to get together with your team. If you want to be, in, you know, if you're more of a, you know, an, an internally referenced type of person, a bit more insular in your kind of, approach and thinking then they can be supported and, and, and to be fair I think that's for the benefit of the industry because a lot of these introverted people struggle in an industry yeah. that is driven by extrovertism for want yeah. of a better word yeah you know if you go back to call centers of the late 90s 2000s it was all very kind of let's all do these massive incentives and let's mm. ring bell yeah. dance around the call center and do all this type of stuff and, 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 and a lot of people liked it, but a lot of people did it and wouldn't come into the industry or wouldn't stay in a role because they felt out of place, mm. because it didn't suit them. Whereas now they can sit at home, do their job, do their work to a very high standard and not have, and, and, and still be introverted because that's their personality mm. and not feel out of place being an introvert. You know, I, I think there's, there's so many benefits to it. Yeah. I just think we just need to embrace that it's changing and, 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 and for the better in a, in a lot of cases. I love that. There's so much that you've shared. It's just great to to have you back and um, not that you've been away, but have you back on the on the podcast because there's some really there's some is some gold here, mate. And that um, purposeful presence, I love the vacu stuff. I love and but also this, you are right that you're evangelical about what are we doing in the industry to 
professionalize it and get in, you know, if you're 250 people going through that, that's two, going to be 250 people that are proud of the industry, advocates for the industry, will talk proudly to friends and relatives about where they work, the accreditation they've got, and that's what we need, because you're dead right. You've got someone coming to do an academic study who very openly said, look, you know, her view of the industry was the same as a lot of people's out there that don't know it, which is, yeah. so only, they only hear negative, negative things. So more power to you and everyone at the forum, Chris. Um, Not pleasure. We've got through a whole episode without mentioning football on the last day of the Premiership. I'm just going to say one phrase, never in doubt. <laughs> yeah. yeah i would like to say the same about tottenham getting fourth but um history has taught me otherwise to get too confident about the team but we both had very good days let's say at the end of the premier league didn't we y yes i'm not going to say i can't remember it but i had a very good day good chris thanks very much and look forward to the next one of these that we're going to do yes yeah, speak soon uh nice to meet everybody see you all soon take care thank bye -bye. you bye-bye